Amen? Amen. Amen. A lot of good... uh, a lot of good music this morning, so we're very thankful. And at this time, we are going to uh, go to our study in the book of Mark, and uh, we're excited to be here worshiping together. And as we're continuing our study, we're in Mark chapter 6, and I'd ask you to turn your Bibles to that passage this morning. We're going to be considering this morning the first six verses of Mark chapter 6. And so let me ask you to stand, uh, please, as I'd like to read for you these these six verses that we'll be looking at this morning. The Bible says in verse 1, Jesus went out from there and came into his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. And the many listeners were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? And what is this wisdom given to him and such miracles as these performed by his hands. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his own relatives and in his own household. And he could do no miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he wondered at their unbelief. Father in heaven, we come to you this morning and we pray that you would speak to our hearts through the word of God today. Father, truly this passage describes for us a tragedy of disbelief. And Father, we are amazed that Jesus was amazed. And we pray, Father, that you would help us to be people of faith today, that we might be pleasing in your sight. And we pray all of these things now in Christ's precious name. Amen. Please be seated. Reading at the end there of our passage in verse 6, and in the New American Standard, it says, and he wondered at their unbelief. Reading in my Holman Study Bible, I was reading that, and it says that Jesus was amazed at their unbelief. Do you know that there are only two places in the New Testament that describes Jesus being amazed? And both of those passages are passages that deal with faith. Over in Luke chapter 7, Jesus is amazed at the centurion who, because of a sickness within the home there, he comes to Jesus, and Jesus looks at this this Roman, this Gentile, and he is amazed at this man's faith, that this man would come and seek Jesus' help in healing this person in in his employ. And the other place is right here where we find, again, the issue is faith. Jesus looks at the people in Nazareth, and he is amazed amazed that they have none. You know, it's pretty amazing at this point in our study that we run into disbelief at this level. There are many examples in the scriptures of people who didn't have faith. Uh, You can go all the way back to the Garden of Eden and you can look there at uh, Eve. Uh, In fact, if Eve had had more faith, we wouldn't be in this mess. Isn't that true? If she'd have just looked at what God had told her and said to herself, you know, I need to believe that it's really bad if I eat of that one tree that Jesus said not to eat or that God said not to eat of. I really shouldn't have done that. If she'd have just believed God, it would be so different today, wouldn't it? Wow. Think of the time of Noah when Noah is called upon to build the ark. And all the people mocked Noah. They thought he was ridiculous for doing that. They they thought this was ludicrous, Noah. I mean, it's never even rained on the earth, and you're trying to tell us that we have a need for for this. And and so he builds this enormous ark, and when it's done, all of a sudden the skies open up, and the ground opens up, and there's more water than the people have ever seen. The people had only had faith. You remember when Moses sends the ten spies into the land, the promised land, What was the percentage of people who came back and said, yeah, I think, you know, this is no problem? Yeah, it wasn't great, was it? You had Caleb and Joseph, or Joshua, and that's it. 
The others said, no way. There is no way that this is going to work out for us. There's giants in the land. They're enormous, and this is a huge problem. And they didn't exercise faith in God. And because of that, you have the wilderness wanderings. Oh, if we would only learn to, to have faith in God. When Stephen is stoned over in the book of Acts chapter 7, he is stoned because he said to the religious leaders who were also people who lacked faith, that they were stiff-necked, that they were uncircumcised in their heart and in their hearing. Always, he says, you're resisting the Holy Spirit of God. That's what Stephen said, and that got him killed because they had resisted faith in Almighty God. In this passage of Scripture, Jesus shows us the tragedy of disbelief. And it's something that we should avoid with great urgency. Now, as you come to this passage, what's so amazing as you look at it, one of the things that's so remarkable is the fact that we've been on a journey in the book of Mark. I've really enjoyed our time going through Mark. It's been so much fun to see how things have been progressing. All the way from the very beginning, when Jesus is baptized by John, and you have this miraculous event. And then it goes from there as Jesus teaches in the synagogue. There's someone who, who starts to yell out and that person is, is demon possessed and Jesus casts out the demon. How fabulous that was. And then recently as we've been going through, Jesus is, is teaching there and there's a multitude of people and he's there in the boat and decides, you know, it's time to go across to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And you know what happened. The huge storm came up, the waves were enormous, they were filling the boat, and everyone on those boats thought for themselves, this is the end, we are going to perish. And Jesus is there, and he's called upon by the disciples, not so much because of faith, but because of desperation. And Jesus speaks, and he calms the sea, and the winds died right out. And they were able to get to the other side. Of course, getting to the other side was no picnic. A man that had literally thousands of demons within him came running down the slope uh, to meet them when Jesus stepped out of the boat. And how amazing it was that Jesus would have the power not only to, to be over nature and stop the storm right in its tracks, but Jesus was also able to cast out those demons. This is amazing, the power of Jesus. 25 miles away from Capernaum is a town called Nazareth. And word travels fast, even though there's no internet, no phone, no Pony Express. But the word traveled quickly. And Jesus comes to this point where he is tremendously popular with the masses. People are interested in what he has to say. When he's, when he's teaching, he's teaching uh, from a boat because he can't even step on shore because the crowd would push up against him. And so he's in a boat and it's over the people's heads where the water is and they can't get out there close enough to tread water long enough. And so they stay on the shore and Jesus teaches them. Wherever he goes, there's people seeking him out, synagogue officials as we found last time. He's even raised the dead. So he stills the storm, his power over nature. He casts out these demons. Last time he heals the woman who'd been sick for 12 years, and then he raises Jairus' daughter from the dead. He is popular. We're interested in what he has to say and where he's going to go. And it's at this point, the Bible says there in verse 1, Jesus went out from there and came into his hometown. So he goes from healing Jairus' daughter, and he's going to go to Nazareth. Jesus, at this point in time, we can say without question, is motivated because he sees a spiritual need on the point of his friends and his neighbors. Jesus is motivated. He is deeply motivated. Comes to his hometown, the Bible says. That's that little place called Nazareth. Nazareth is a small town of about 500 people. 500, that's all. How many have ever lived in a small town that's smaller than 500? One. None in the first service, but one in the second. All right. It is safe to assume that if you live in a small town like that, you're going to know everyone and everyone's going to know you. Would you assume that that is true? 
absolutely, there's something to be said for that. For when Mary and Joseph left Bethlehem, Jesus, being under the age of two, arrives in Nazareth. And he's lived there then until he is 30 years of age. You talk about knowing everybody and everybody knowing you. This was classic small town. I remember when our parent, my parents moved to um, Massachusetts down onto Cape Cod, we had a grand total of 2,000 people in our town. 2,000, that's all we had. Uh, we had a police chief and the sergeant, that was it. And uh, the little jail, if you had two people that needed to go to jail, one had to stay in the back seat of the cruiser because we only had this little tiny cell. And, and it was just part of the room and it was in the back of the fire department and it was as big as your two-car garage. I mean, that was the whole deal. And, and it was so cool because everybody did know everybody. You literally walked from our home. We lived on a, a road maybe three-quarters of a mile long total, and we were the only year-round residents on that street. And we'd, I'd walk up to the end of the road, and I'd go in there to get the newspaper. And he had all the newspapers all lined up for the customers, and he would write your name on the newspaper, <laughs> lest somebody from off Cape came and bought your newspaper. You know what I'm saying? You see, that was the small town. You knew everybody, and, and it, was, it was fun. It was a different way of, of living life. We went to central Pennsylvania there, and we were there for 15 years. The town where the church was was, was 3,000 deep, uh, maybe the greater area, about 10,000 or so. It was always fun. I played basketball, played basketball with our accountant, our attorney, and our pharmacist. <laughs> you knew everybody in town. It was just that way. And, and sometimes there was huge benefits of knowing everybody. I remember one time I was kind of distracted and I pulled into the Sunoco gas station, which was part of the shopping center in a local area. There was a bank there, a pharmacy, general store type of thing, and, and the grocery store and, and the Sunoco gas pumps. And I pulled in and I pumped my gas, filled the truck up, put the gas thing back in there and jumped in the truck and took off. That was before the credit card at the pump. Totally forgot to pay, just drove off. And I remember thinking to myself as I got down the road, you know, I think I forgot to pay for the gas. And, and the lady whose husband and she owned the place thought, oh, it's no big deal. There goes Kevin. He's distracted and he forgot. And she wrote it down and I paid for it later. You see, the small town has its advantages. Now, for Jesus, there's 500 people there and he knows them all. And he also knows the reality when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. How many people can come to the Father except it be through Jesus? None. And so he recognizes this tremendous spiritual need among people that he's known his entire life. As some of these people might have been his, his teachers. We don't ever read of Jesus' friends, but do you suppose Jesus had a friend or two? Quite possibly. These were people that were maybe customers of his. Maybe the teachers that he heard as a young boy growing up going to the synagogue. These were people that he heard teach. And all of these people mattered to Jesus. And so Jesus is excited about going to his hometown. Take your Bible and flip over a few pages to Luke chapter 4. In Luke chapter 4, the passage here, and I'm just going to start here in verse 1. Jesus is full of the Holy Spirit, and the Bible says he returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days. This is the temptation of Jesus Christ. Jesus being tempted by Satan directly, he is victorious through the quoting of Scripture and the standing on the Word of God. But he is full of the Holy Spirit. When he returns to Galilee, he's coming in verse 14 in the power of the Holy Spirit. News about him is spread through the surrounding districts. And he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. He comes to Nazareth, verse 16, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath, stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. I want you to see that. It was handed to him. He did not go and seek that. It was handed to him. And he opened the book, found the place where it was written. This is Isaiah chapter 61, where it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. 
Go back to verse 1. Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. What had happened just prior to that, it was no doubt the baptism of Jesus where we have the Holy Spirit of God as it was likened unto a dove that was coming down upon Jesus. So Jesus is full of the Spirit of God and as he comes in this, He's reading Isaiah 61, and it says there, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and set free those who are oppressed to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. That is a messianic passage, would you agree? It is speaking directly there of the Messiah. When Jesus gets done, and he's done reading that passage in Isaiah, he closes the book, gave it back to the attendant, and he went and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixated on him. And he began to say to them, I mean, they're all looking at him like, whoa. And he looks at them and says, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Whoo. Seriously, what did Jesus just say? I am the Messiah. I am the Messiah. Isaiah 61 has been fulfilled as you've been sitting there listening to me read it. Wow. That is amazing. Now the people of Nazareth have to grapple with who this Jesus is. Who is Jesus? And the Bible says they were speaking well of him, and they were wondering about the gracious words which were falling from his lips, and they were saying, is this not Joseph's son? As we're going to see later, that was not commendable, that was not a commendable comment. That is not a favorable comment. And Jesus perceives what was behind that statement, and he says, no doubt, he says, you'll quote this proverb to me. Here's the proverb, physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said to them, truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. But I say to you that in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the sky was shut up for three and a half years. There was a great famine. And Jesus says, yet Elijah was sent to none of them. None of them. There were a lot of widows, but only Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. Why would he go, Elijah would, why would he go there? Because she had faith. There were many lepers in Israel during the time of Elisha the prophet. None of them was cleansed but Nahum. Do you remember Nahum? He wasn't even from around there, but he had faith. And the people perceived what Jesus was trying to say. And the Bible says in verse 28, they were filled with rage. And as they heard these things, they got up and they drove Jesus out of the synagogue and out of the city to the point where the brow of the hill, where the city had been built upon, and he was backed right up to the edge. And the Bible says there that they were going to throw him down the cliff. Excuse me? These are the people Jesus grew up with. They've known him since he was this little. And now they're ready to commit murder as a mob. Doesn't that blow your mind? What are they thinking? They were so filled with rage at the words Jesus said to think that somehow this man has the audacity to speak these things, that we need to repent and believe. They were ready to exterminate him from the planet. And the coolest thing happens right there. I'd have loved to have been there to see that. But Jesus just vaporized and walked back on through the crowd. And they didn't know what happened to him. Isn't that cool? That's that whole glorified body thing that we're going to have. Now, that's going to be pretty exciting, right? I mean, that, that is pretty neat. That is really neat stuff. I mean, wouldn't you just love to have that power now? I mean, that's amazing. God is all powerful. Now, What we see here in this passage is the disbelief that leads to Jesus' amazement. And we fast forward at this point many months. And I'm going to go back here to Mark chapter 6. And if you'd turn back there with me, I want you to notice that 
at this point, the Bible says in verse one that Jesus went out from there and he came into his hometown. Mark is much more chronological than the other gospel writers are. And I believe for myself, I believe that there were two visits to Nazareth. I believe there is one right after the temptation and that he comes a second time, leaving Capernaum, going the 25 miles up into the hill country to Nazareth to again go and speak truth to these people whom he dearly, dearly loves. Now, not everyone knows or uh, is in agreement with that, and we can't say this for sure, but as best as I can understand it, I believe that these are two separate occasions. And what I see here is Jesus' motivation and the motivation is still compassion, and I believe there is a level of compassion that is deeper here for his family. He comes to his hometown. The disciples are with him. And it's not unusual to have a rabbi in, in, in company by a, a group of, of his followers, and that's kind of what we see with Jesus coming now with the disciples, and they come to Nazareth. Without a doubt, Jesus is moved with tremendous compassion. The acquaintances, the friends, but also the family. And there's something special about our families, especially family members who are not yet believers. Would you agree with that? We are concerned, no doubt, and God is concerned for the, for the salvation of all people everywhere. Doesn't matter where they live, doesn't matter what their background is. Jesus Christ died for the sins of the whole world. And I believe we have the responsibility to send that gospel out. But there is something that's very, very personalized when we think of the relationship that our family may or may not have with Jesus Christ. And we are burdened heavily for lost loved ones, aren't we? We pray for them. We seek opportunities to speak the truth to them because they're precious. They are so vital in our lives and we see the significance of desiring for them to come to faith in Christ. Is this the motivation that is behind Jesus is coming back to Nazareth? Perhaps so. Notice with me in verse two that when the Sabbath day came, he comes back to Nazareth. I believe that the people were willing to hear what he had to say. And the Bible says that he went into the synagogue at this point in time, again, the masses are in love with Jesus. The people are, are screaming his praises. He's doing amazing things. And, and there are fans everywhere. And I think these people just wanted to hear again what the teaching of Jesus was all about. The Bible says when Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. Jesus' teaching, can I just say this, is distinctly different from the teaching that you and, Eve, you and I have experienced. If Jesus Christ was here today, his teaching would not be anything like what I'm doing right now. And the, only, the closest I can get is just to read the Bible. That is the closest I can get to what God would actually be doing. Because in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So Jesus, every word that proceeds out of his mouth is the word of God. Are you with me? And so when he would teach, he taught very, very differently. In fact, uh, Matthew 7 says that this teaching was as one having authority, not like the scribes. And the scribes were incredibly knowledgeable about God's word, but they could not, with the authority of Jesus, speak the same way. And so when Jesus is talking, there is no process whereby God gives his word to uh, those who are inspired and have written it down, and then it comes to us. This is directly from God to man's ears. No one teaches like that, not with that kind of authority. We go back through, we try to figure out the passage. If you've been in Grasping God's Word Bible study this, this summer, you know that we go through a process as we try to understand how do we interpret God's Word. Jesus was also incredibly knowledgeable. In John chapter 7, people ask the question, how has this man become learned? He's never been educated. Here's this man, he has no degrees, and yet he's able to teach like this. What is going on? 
He was powerful in his speech, Luke chapter four. He was unmatched in his speech. John chapter seven, verse 46, where they said, never has a man spoken as this man speaks. We've never heard anyone like him. This is mind boggling. The crowd was amazed. They were astonished. Notice what it says here. His, liter- his listeners were astonished saying, where did this man get these things? And again, that word astonished is, it literally means to strike or, or to blast something. And literally the best way I can put it is, again, their minds were blown by it. They just were amazed. They're hearing Jesus, they're listening to what he has to say, and it's like, wow, this is absolutely incredible. But what would the results be? The Bible says they took offense at him. They took offense at him, verse 3. What Jesus was saying, even though it was unbelieving, unbelievable, it was powerful, it was authoritative, we've never heard anyone speak like this, what Jesus said to them was offensive. So all the people there in the synagogue that day were offended by what he had to say. The word offended is the word we get the English word scandalized from. Literally means to cause someone to stumble. You know, the word of God can produce different results in people's hearts. Do you know that? Ever stop and think about it? Sometimes we read God's word and we just grab a hold of it and it's just so sweet. And there are other times when we read God's word, the spirit of the Lord speaks to our hearts and we get convicted Isn't that fun? Isn't that fun? It is amazing how God knows everything that's going on in our heart and mind, right? I mean, we read it and God says, all right, let's have a talk. Sometimes when we're confronted by the truth, we don't want to acknowledge it and agree with it. We don't want to, and that's what the word confess means, we don't want to agree with it And because of that, it becomes a point of stumbling to us. I remember back when I was in my 20s, um, first church plant, I remember a lady coming up to me in the church and saying, Pastor Kevin, do you think it's okay to do X? And uh, whenever anybody asks you that, you're always like, "Uh uh-oh, you know, uh, I, I'll read the Bible to you. So I, I showed this person some things from God's word. And I remember her, to this day, I remember her looking at me and, and saying, boy, I wish I knew this after I came back from vacation. She was just on her way to vacation, and it was a point of stumbling for her, you see. You see, the problem for these people in Nazareth was that they were looking at Jesus, and Jesus was a point of stumbling for them. They were offended at him because of who he was. Notice in that passage that it, just before it says there that they were offended. Notice their reaction after they said, where does this man get these things, and what is this wisdom given to him, and such miracles as these performed by his hands? Verse 3, here you have it. Is not this the carpenter? son of Mary, brother of James, sisters here, and so forth, and then they were offended by him. Is this not the carpenter? After all, he's just like us. The word carpenter there in the original means he is a craftsman. Jesus was the craftsman in the village. A craftsman, as designated by the Greek term, could be someone who was great with wood, metal or stone he could do it all you needed a remodel jesus is your man all right he could go in there and it would turn out perfect every single time jesus is well known but he is just your average guy and there's mary she's a nice lady she makes great lasagna but you know she's just normal she's just flesh and blood how can it be that you're telling me that the messiah from isaiah 61 is that carpenter who's got brothers and sisters who aren't even people of faith yet 
How is it possible that he could be the redeemer? You see, it continues on from his time of being born in Bethlehem. Shouldn't the, the king of the universe have been born in Jerusalem in a king's palace? But alas, he's born in a manger, and the people who are celebrating his identity as the true coming Messiah and rejoicing are the shepherds, people who weren't even allowed in a court of law. How is it possible? You see, the problem was, and the problem still is, the people of Nazareth, were steeped in their own self-righteousness. So when they looked at Jesus, they saw someone, why should I believe him? Why should I follow him? He's no different than I am. Yeah, he's a carpenter, I'm a plumber. What difference does it make? We're all men. We put our, our, our pants on one leg at a time. How is it that he is the Messiah? You see, their self-righteousness kept them from embracing the teaching of Jesus, which was clearly to repent and believe, to have a change of mind towards your own self-righteousness. And the result of this is the tragedy of disbelief. Notice here in this passage that Jesus says to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown. That was a proverbial statement that was made there. It was something that um, we, would, we would get the phrase today, familiarity breeds contempt, exactly. And so as such, uh, we see with the person of Jesus that he could do no miracle there except that he laid a few hands on people and healed them. It was not a question, verse 5, of whether or not Jesus' power uh, was uh, constrained. Jesus still could have done many miracles there. Faith is important, but Jesus, if you recall, did do many miracles where faith was not present. Remember the 10 lepers that he heals? How many of those lepers came back and thanked him and had faith? One. Remember the man who was down by the pool of Bethesda? Uh, he didn't even know who Jesus was when Jesus healed him. The man who was born blind had no idea until after he was healed, and then he placed faith in him. When Jesus raised someone from the dead, he did so without requiring faith from them. Would you agree? You see, Jesus is able to do those miracles, but he doesn't do these miracles because he is amazed at their unbelief. The purpose of miracles was not for entertainment. Can I make that clear? Even though people were looking to be entertained, that was not the purpose. The purpose for those miracles was to authenticate the message and the messenger of the Savior, the Messiah, so that people would place their faith in Jesus. And when the people of Nazareth out and out reject Jesus, there is no reason to do any more miracles there. Because their faith was non-existent. So the work of God in Nazareth would come to a screeching halt. Jesus marveled, wondered, whatever word that translation might be, was amazed that they had this unbelief. You and I have some things to think about. How do we approach the Lord today? Is it with faith and trust? Or are we always second guessing what God is doing in our lives? That's a fair question, isn't it? The second question that we need to think about is, if we've seen the love of God and the compassion of the Savior, have we responded with faith? Have you, have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ and in him alone? That's the big question, isn't it? That's a question that you need to answer today. To die without faith in Christ Jesus is truly the definition of the tragedy of unbelief or disbelief. The last thing I want you to stop and consider is your lack of faith holding back the work of God in your life. The people in Nazareth should have been, should have become a hotbed for Christianity. They should have embraced Jesus. 
They, they should have been so privileged and counted themselves as such to have an understanding that there was Messiah growing up in their midst and embraced him with faith. They should have been in a position to see the greatest amount of miracles being done. Why is it not that, that, that Nazareth isn't the central point, the central hub of Jesus' teachings? Why does it have to be Capernaum? Why don't all the people have to come to Nazareth? It was because of their disbelief. If you're here today and you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, that's a huge, huge thing. Most important decision that you could ever make. But if you're here and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, it's important that as followers of Christ, we also embrace Jesus through faith on a daily basis. How many Christians oftentimes do not have faith and then don't see the work of God going on anywhere in their life? All of us are requiring various amounts of faith. Some here are requiring small amounts of faith. Maybe it's just something that's very small in your life right now on the whole scope of things, at least in your mind. It's not huge. Others, God is challenging you to step out in faith and do something enormous in your life. The points that we miss and the lack of faith that we have gives to us the same result that we have here in chapter 6, where we do not see the working of God. Many churches never see the working of God because there's a lack of faith. We tend to want to walk by sight and not by faith. I remember reading Jerry Falwell's autobiography some time ago, and I remember the one thing that, in that whole book that stood out to me, something I've always remembered, was he made the statement, he said, I never ask how much something's going to cost. I always want to know, is it something that God is leading us to do? Because the idea is that if God is leading me, he will be faithful to provide the means necessary. The question isn't, oh, how much is this going to cost? What am I going to do? Are we going to be able to do? Oh, I don't know. The question is, what is God doing? For us, it's important to understand the significance of this because we can miss out on so many of the things that God wants to accomplish in our lives if we withhold that faith. For the people at Nazareth, it's an eternal destination thing. You don't get any bigger stakes than this. It's heaven or hell. For you, if you've never placed your faith in Christ, I urge you this morning, to take that step of faith and call on the name of the Lord Jesus and know what it means to have your sins forgiven. If you're here as a follower of Christ already, you've made that decision, will you now walk by faith? A critical point for you to consider. Would you stand with me, please, as we bow our heads before the Lord this morning? Let's just take a moment to bow our heads before the Lord, as I mentioned, and let's stop and look into our own hearts. The tragedy of unbelief in Nazareth is staggering. I am amazed that Jesus was amazed. I can't tell you that enough. When the Bible says that he was, was amazed, it's, it's, I find it troubling. If you're here today and you've yet to place your faith in Christ, how I urge you not not to miss an opportunity that can change your life. Will you call upon the name of the Lord? Let me urge us right now, if you're here today and you've yet to do that, would you pray? Would you put your faith in Jesus? Would you lay aside your self-righteousness and realize that it's for your sin and my sin that Jesus went to the cross? Will you put your personal faith in him? Maybe you're here this morning and you'd say, I know I should be walking by faith. I know God's got some great things that he'd like to do in my life, but I'm holding back. And so these things aren't being realized. There are folks at the front who would love to talk with you, pray with you after the service. If God's at work in your heart today, 
I encourage you to check them out. Father, we thank you for your word today. Lord, we can't thank you enough for the compassion that we see in the person of our Savior, Jesus Christ. It was not only compassion that led him to the cross, but we see his compassion throughout his ministry. And Father, we're moved by that compassion. Help us, Lord, to be people of faith. Help us not to reject Jesus. But Father, help us to embrace him and allow him to work in our life on a daily basis, accomplishing all those things that he has for us. Work in our lives today and throughout this week ahead, I pray. And I pray these all, all these things in Christ's precious name. Amen. Well, God bless you. Have an awesome week. And again, if you're visiting with us, don't forget, fill out a visitor's card, get a free gift bag. There's some chocolate in it out there in the foyer. God bless you. <laughs>